In 12 months and 60,000 kilometres, Katie and I have seen a lot of Australia. We started with Tasmania, tackled the mountains of the Victorian high country, explored the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, the Oodnadatta track and the Red Centre in the heart of Australia. We crossed more than a thousand sand dunes on the Madigan Line in the Simpson, spent 10 days exploring Fraser Island with my uncle, tackled all the toughest tracks in Cape York, including the Kreb, the Frenchman's and the mighty Old Telly. We crossed the top of Australia, visiting national parks and remote Kakadu wilderness and the mighty Gibb River Road to wind up all the way around in Perth. It has been a huge 12 months and almost 60,000 kilometers to all the highlights Australia has to offer. But even still, there's one track that haunts me and I know I'll regret it for the rest of my life if I don't tackle it now while I have the chance. The Canning Stock Route is the world's most remote 4x4 track. The time is now. Let's do this. Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Road Chose Me. This one is something I've been looking forward to for at least 15 years. My dad just flew in and together we are tackling the Canning Stock Route. This is the pinnacle of remote four wheel drive travel in Australia and maybe even the entire planet. So we've driven up, we're at the very start of the track. We have loaded the Jeep with more fuel, more food and more water than ever before. We think this is going to take two to three weeks of remote desert travel. We actually don't even know for sure. Just let down the tires, put on the sand flag, the CB radio's turned on. We are ready to go. This will be the pinnacle of Australia. I absolutely cannot wait. I hope you'll join us for the adventure. Let's go with my dad on board. Here it comes, the Canning Stock Route. In 1910, the legendary Canning Stock Route was completed as a way to move cattle from the north of Western Australia down to the capital of Perth. Today, it exists as a series of old wells starting with number one in the south all the way to number 51. Over the next couple of weeks, my dad and I plan to drive more than 1,700 kilometers through the desert on the harshest and longest off-road four-wheel drive track in the world. We top off with fuel in Waluna before hitting the track soon after lunch. The track is divided into segments between each watering well. Some of them are in good condition and actually provide drinking water, while others are barely a depression in the sand. We've started our trip on the 10th of November, which is extremely late in the season. The chances are nobody else will be out here with us. The risks of doing it this late in the year are that summer is fast approaching and temperatures will be scorching hot. More than that though, the rainy season is approaching in the north. Once the torrential rains start, the track will be completely impassable and we're running the risk of hitting those storms before we even finish. We might get stuck, we may never make it out of here. So for that reason, we've planned all along to keep moving. While it would be great to slow down and smell the roses, we're on a bit of a mission to get this one done. To tackle this mighty track, we're carrying 250 litres of fuel and I'm happy to get the weight off the roof rack as soon as I possibly can. Every time we complete another 100 or so kilometres, I empty another jerry into the main tank. 
We've only been on the canning a day and a half and it becomes immediately clear that this track is all about constant change. Just when we get used to one driving surface, everything changes and it feels like we're on a completely different track. At times we're in deep sand and just a few minutes later, we'll have a rocky scramble up and over an outcropping. After that, we drive through thick trees and brush that scrape the sides of the Jeep and then we're back onto sand before we find some corrugations, some deep scrub, back into the rocks, back into the sand. Just as we get used to one surface, it changes and we're on a completely different surface. The southern end of the track passes through a few cattle stations and so for the first couple of days, we do still see some development. There's the odd gate that needs to be opened and closed and there is actually now evidence of mining exploration. It actually looks a lot like Yukon or Alaska where it's clear they're out here digging test pits and taking samples away, trying to find whatever precious minerals they can find out of the soil. Late in the afternoon, we spot these few kangaroos darting across the track. It's the first sign of life we've seen on the canning and it's kind of surprising to see something else moving in the desert. Kangaroos are notoriously shy and they get away from the vehicle as fast as they can. Luckily I had the drone in the air and I kind of kept up with them for a while, but they can actually move a lot faster than I can fly the drone. There's a huge amount of washout damage on the track and it's hard to say if it's been from rain that's happened in the last couple of weeks or if this is the damage from the last rainy season almost a year ago. We don't see any other evidence of actual water on the ground, so I assume it must be from nearly 12 months ago. Fingers crossed they're not having huge rain events down here just yet. So here we are everyone, you just saw us set up camp. We are about 10 meters off the canning stock route because there is absolutely no one out here. There is no traffic. We don't need to worry about a quiet night. It will be silent here tonight. But yeah, things are going really well. This is, uh, this is camp for us for the night. We just found a spot. This is fine. We're gonna be up and moving before the sun really comes out in the morning anyway. And uh, so we've got the swag set up, just hung up the old shower bag. This thing's been around the world with me a few times. So we probably have showers tonight. Time to put another jerry can into the main tank few little housekeeping jobs and then time to cook dinner maybe chicken with stir fry noodles probably the chicken had the shortest use by date so start with that and go from there now it's time to relax it's nice to be out of the jeep this is it the sounds of silence out in the desert it is extremely peaceful out here it seems like the flies are just about to disappear for the night welcome to camp on the counting Good morning everyone and what a morning it is. It is just after five o'clock in the morning and I walked up to this kind of rocky outcrop above camp and it's just stunning out here. I can just hear some birds chirping, there's a bit of breeze this morning. It's been windy actually the whole time we've been on the trail. <laughs> and here is the world according to the desert we're in. There's the moon up there, super bright last night. But you can see there is nothing out here. This is utterly incredible. And actually you can see there's a ton of wildflowers around. These ones up on top of the rocky outcrop are really cool. Down lower there was a few different kinds. There's purple ones, there's white kind of clumpy ones. I guess I keep forgetting that it really is springtime here or early summer now in Australia. So it makes sense. Uh, plants have their seed pods open. There's a lot of flowers on, on the ground and on trees. But I'm just gonna take this in, sit up here until the sun comes up. It looks like I'm maybe five minutes away from the sun breaking the horizon. And wander down, get on the trail, which the Jeep is right there, center of frame. And the trail goes off that way. Can't even see it from here. It is so small. I think it's safe to say we're in the middle of nowhere now. The sun comes up as I'm walking back to camp 
and Dad's awake by the time I get there. We decide to hit the trail, and so we quickly roll up the swag, throw it in, and get moving for the day, knowing that we'll have breakfast down the road somewhere when we find a nice shady spot. As with the day before, the desert resumes immediately, switching between gravel, rock, overgrown tree sections, sand, dirt, and everything in between. I'm more than a little bit excited as we climb up and over our first few bright red sand dunes. I know there's at least a thousand more to come and I'm sure they're going to get a lot more interesting. We have the sand flag mounted on the roof in an attempt to avoid a collision on top of a dune. The idea being that a vehicle coming in the opposite direction will see the flag and hopefully I would see their flag and we could both stop before actually hitting each other. As you can see, when you come over the crest of a dune, it is impossible to see what's on the other side. So fingers crossed the sand flag would prevent that. The canyon is notorious for having some of the worst corrugations in Australia. I guess pretty much every vehicle that passes here is heavily loaded with fuel, water and supplies and so they all weigh three, four, five, maybe even six tons. All of that combined with zero road maintenance over decades and decades of four wheel drivers passing leads to some really, really nasty corrugations. Compared to big land cruisers, the Gladiator is actually on the lighter end of the scale and so we do really well skimming across the corrugations at about 20 psi tyre pressure. You can see in quite a few places here where people have forked off from the main trail in an attempt to avoid the nasty corrugations. I don't want to venture off the main trail, but I do occasionally take one of the smaller side tracks, hoping to stay away from the worst of it. After a few hours on the track, we spot another sign of life, wild camels. They're directly on the track and they slowly move out of the way while I get the drone ready so I can get this incredible shot of them. They don't seem to care about the drone too much. Wild camels are an enormous problem in Australia. They were brought here back in the day to help develop inland Australia and Afghan traders used them to forge some of these desert routes through the heart of the country. Supremely adapted to the harsh conditions, the camels did great and helped develop remote and rural Australia. Once they were no longer needed, they were turned loose and now there are over a million of them wreaking havoc on the native wildlife and ecosystem. Because they drink so much water and eat so much food, they're displacing natural wildlife. Nobody really knows what to do about this problem. There's just so many of them and the wilderness is so vast. The Australian government does actually cull them by helicopter, but at this point, how are they ever going to deal with over a million wild animals out here in this kind of remote landscape? On every day on the Canning stock route, we saw multiple herds of wild camels, sometimes 10 or 15 animals in a group. There really are that many of them roaming around out here. As you can see, we've been tackling more and more bright red sand dunes. And as we crest one, I'm excited to see an enormous dry salt lake span out in front of us. I actually have no idea where the trail goes 
and I've intentionally avoided watching other people's YouTube videos or reading too much online about the track. I love that this is a surprise and I legitimately have no idea what's over the top of every sand dune. The salt lake stretches far into the distance and we just skirt the edge, staying off the salt that not only would corrode the bottom of the Jeep, but also could be very soft. There's every chance if we drive out on this thing, we'll never get the Jeep out again with nothing to winch to. I'd much rather stay on the firm sand on the edges than venture into that, not knowing what might happen. The afternoon wears on and the shadows start to grow. With nothing better to do, we decide to keep driving. Outside the Jeep it's scorching hot and we get attacked by flies, so we figure we may as well keep driving in the hopes of getting to what we know is an incredible destination. There are, however, two surprises left for us before we can get there. With no warning at all, we come across this sneaky rocky section between wells 15 and 16. We're headed down the little rock steps, and so the Jeep has no problem at all in low range. I have Dad at the steering wheel while I'm filming, and he does just great. Although our book does mention that most people actually travel in the opposite direction, and there have been some serious problems in this spot over the years, including people breaking their axles. Now, I don't know how you break an axle on an obstacle like this. I'm assuming plenty of right foot is involved, and I just don't understand why you would do that when you're this far from civilization. As always, slow and steady is the name of the game, and we just roll on through without any kind of problem. We're in high range four wheel drive for all the dune climbs, and at 20 PSI, the grip provided by the tyres is enormous and we have absolutely no problem moving forward. In fact, I don't think the Jeep even spins a tyre once, just climbing the dunes slow and steady. As the afternoon pushes on, we find ourselves travelling next to an enormous rocky escarpment, the first major landscape feature we've seen in almost three days. It's absolutely breathtaking, and once I put the drone in the air, I get a sense of just how big it really is. Looking at our map and reading the book, I'm pretty confident I know what's around the corner. I've never seen photos of it, and it absolutely drops my jaw when we drive into the oasis in the desert. All right, so we've just set up camp at the end of a very long day. And you might be looking around and wondering, where on earth are you guys? And that is exactly how I feel. I'm pretty exhausted, I'm a bit disoriented. This place is called Durba Springs. And this is literally an oasis in the desert. So we crossed 50 sand dunes today. We went past those salt lakes. It's been sharp, prickly, spiny things all day long. We drove around the corner and this is what we've driven into. So there's these huge red rock walls, there's grass, there's gum trees. Why is all of this stuff here? It's because there is a spring just over there. So there really is water coming out of the ground. The water's a little bit murky at this time of year. It's a bit stagnant. I don't think I'm gonna go and drink it or anything like that. And the local Aboriginal people, obviously they've known about this for eons. 
and they ask that we don't swim in it because it's a cultural site. But you can see what a paradise. I feel like we've just washed off the dust and the dirt from the day, even though we haven't washed off anything, simply because it's no longer scorching hot, simply because we're not currently camping on rock or, you know, with sharp prickly bushes around. So Durba Springs, an oasis, literally in the desert. We are going to rest and recuperate, recharge our batteries as much as we can before we continue and just keep going on the canning. We still have a very, very long way to go. Let's see what happens from here on out. walking up a dune here so I can get some photos and some videos and uh, this is really fun to see. The only tracks in the sand are camel tracks. So I'm just following the camels. There has not been a vehicle through here. We checked the guest books in a few different of the campsites. There has not been a vehicle through here in two and a half, three weeks. So it feels pretty impressive to be out here, especially when we get to the top of the dune and it's just sand blown, wind blown sand. It's all smooth and flat. You're not following tire tracks. You're not just following the leader. I love this. In the morning, we toy with the idea of taking a rest day. We're basically in paradise and I'm sure we have enough food and water to make it work. The stressful part though, is the rainy season in the north. We honestly don't know how close we're going to be pushing it. And I don't want to risk our luck any more than we need to. It's only day four and we're not too exhausted yet. So after a quick pack up, we hit the road and soon enough, we're back out in the hot, dry, dusty desert, just where things left off yesterday. As you can see, we're tackling a lot of dunes today and it's pretty consistent where we go up and over every single one of them. The track usually has an S bend before and after each dune, and that corner is pretty close to where you need to start gaining speed to go up the face. Plenty of the dunes actually have a run up track that makes it more of a straight line. And it's obvious that a lot of vehicles are using these to try and get enough momentum before they get up and over the dune. It's surprising to see because we don't need to use any of them and have no trouble at all. I have to wonder how heavy are these vehicles? Are they towing trailers? And what tire pressure are they running? It's obvious that people really struggle to get over these dunes, but we coast over them with no problem at all. Again, never even spinning a tire. It's highly recommended not to tow a trailer on the canning, and I'm really beginning to see why. We're making it up and over quite easily, but I do have to wonder what it would be like if we were towing basically a boat anchor that no doubt would be full of fuel and water. Around midday, we encounter actual water on the track, something that I've been dreading for a while, as it indicates there's been rainfall recently. This is a bad sign for what we're going to encounter further north. We follow this stunning creek slash river for a while until we actually arrive at Lake Disappointment. This was named by the guys who originally made the canning because they were hoping that it would have water. They were disappointed that it didn't. I have to say, on arriving here, I'm anything but disappointed. This salt lake is absolutely breathtaking and it is ginormous. It reminds me a lot of the Salt Lake in Bolivia and with the scorching sun and the crisp blue sky, the deja vu is really strong. We stop right on the side of the lake to have lunch in the shade at what would be a perfect campsite. It's difficult to take in the size and the scope of everything we're looking at and the realization that there isn't a person in any direction for at least five days of driving. This is pretty wild stuff. A 
after lunch, we just keep moving further and further north. The trail gets more overgrown, the trail gets rocky, there's sand dunes, there's everything as always. We become fixated on the idea of getting to Georgia Bore for the night, where there should be quality drinking water. We're not running low, but it would be nice to use a bit extra to have a shower and wash some clothes. We push on and on and arrive just at sunset. So there we are everyone. That is the completion of day four on the Canning Stock Route. And once again, I'm exhausted. Here we are, this is our camp. We just got to Georgia Bore. And so there's a bore hole drilled over there with kind of a hand pump to get water out. Unfortunately, we just pumped a bunch of water and it smells terrible. It is really milky, has lots of sediment and junk in it. So we won't be using that water for anything. But check it out, this is sunset right now behind me. There is purple in that, there is orange, there is all kinds of colors going on. Uh, Dad and I both just had a shower. We've just got the old shower bag on the side of the awning here. This is of course the same shower that I had for all of Africa. It's pretty hard right now with the red dirt, with the sunset. I mean, I just feel like I'm back in Africa. And I have to say of all the long distance four wheel drive tracks I've ever done in my life, this is like all of them glued together. Every track condition you can imagine, sand dunes, grass, rock scrambles, big open savanna, funny moon rocks, all of it just back to back to back to back. We're only on day four. This thing has so much more to go yet. Canning stock route, I'm gonna sleep like a rock. Man, I cannot wait to see what comes for tomorrow. It's pretty late, we're pretty exhausted. I think it might be leftovers for dinner tonight. In the morning, we join what's called the Talwana track and travel for a brief distance to the east before we turn north again on the canning. It's surprising to drive on a road that's kind of a road compared to what we've been on, even for a short amount of time. From here, if we headed west, we could get to an Aboriginal community called Pangur, which probably has fuel that we can buy. This was my original plan if the Jeep had been consuming too much, but as it turns out, it's not using a lot. In fact, less than it was using in the Simpson, around 18 litres per 100, which on these conditions is really good. That means we have more fuel than I thought we would, and so instead of doing more than a 100 kilometre round trip out to the community and back, we just keep pushing north on the canning Overnight, we had a visitor in camp. A lone dingo was prowling around and he actually woke me up. When I first sat up, he was startled and jumped back and then hung around for quite a while. He got within about 15 feet of our swag on the ground. And I'm not really worried about dingoes. They don't attack adults, but he definitely was curious and was searching around for any scraps of food he could find. In the morning, his tracks were absolutely everywhere. He had patrolled the whole area up and down multiple times. The temperature climbed steadily all day to a max of 39 Celsius, right on 100 Fahrenheit. With the air conditioning running non-stop, the cooling fan in the Jeep also runs quite often. I never see the temperature gauge move and it's really reassuring to be able to keep an eye on the transmission temperature, the oil temperature, and the cooling temperature right on the gauges on the dash. The dunes today are these kind of double headers where we come up over a crest, stay up high on kind of a flat sandy section, and then go over another crest before dropping back down to kind of the valley floor. And as you can see, there is still nothing out here and dunes stretch 
far into the distance. So here we are guys, this is camp for the night. We're at well 29 and uh, we didn't really find a great spot to camp the night. So we're just kind of hunkering. The breeze has gone away. So as you can see, the flies are horrendous again. So I've got the bug net on. Dad's over there reading a book. We've got the swag set up and this is what sunset is starting to do. So pretty exciting. Today has been absolutely huge again. We crossed at least 200 sand dunes. A lot of them were enormous. They were kind of double headers, lots of S bends and stuff in the middle of the dune. It has been another epic day on the canning. This track, I don't even have any words anymore. Not only am I exhausted, but it's the most beautiful track I've ever done in my life. So still so much more to come. Today was day five. I'm starting to lose track. Do it all over again tomorrow and see what we find. Stick with us on the canning stock route. Day six begins like many of the others on the track, with one notable exception, those clouds above us. Being from Australia, clouds are always a weird thing to see, and I'm hyper conscious of the weather and what's going to happen as we get further north. I keep my eyes on them throughout the day and just watch them slowly, slowly develop into something that looks really familiar. Again, the red dirt, the heat, the sun, now the sky, everything's starting to look like the tropical storms that I encountered in Africa. I just watch all day as the clouds build, get darker, and then eventually it starts to rain on us. It's certainly not a tropical downpour and it's not heavy enough that I'm worried about it, but of course we still have many days driving due north which is directly into the rainy season. I wonder what will we find? As always, there's only one way to find out. Good morning everyone. It is the morning of day seven here on the canning and things have taken quite the turn. Uh, yesterday we stopped at an Aboriginal community. It's the only one near the track. And so we fueled up, we refilled our water tank and so we're ready to go for the, like the second half of the trek. We have to keep going and look what the weather has done. The rain has found us. So I guess we're getting far enough north and it is the right time of year that the rainy season is coming. Someone in the little community yesterday said, yeah, you're driving into cyclone season. <laughs> so the only gamble now is, will it be passable? Will we be able to get through or will there be so much mud and so much rain that we can't even continue and we might get stuck and turning around is not really a very viable option at this point. So I think for now we're gonna keep pushing north and we're gonna see what happens and see how much the track has been affected. It rained quite solidly for quite a few hours last night and Judging by the sky, it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. Um, of course, we don't have any internet. We haven't had for a week now, so we can't check the weather. We just have to keep going and see what happens. So join us as we continue here on the canning. Wow, this feels like a different place now. Still stunning, still amazing. This adventure just keeps going.
after setting up camp and cooking dinner, we're treated to an amazing display of heat lightning. I wonder if this is a sign of things to come, and we watch it late into the night. The morning of day eight greeted us bright and sunny with only a smattering of clouds on the horizon. We didn't know at the time, but our morning was consumed climbing dunes. For hour after hour, we attacked them directly, straight up and over, hundreds and hundreds of dunes, all in quick succession. Dad was driving, I was flying the drone and taking photos, and we had an amazing morning up and over more dunes than I can even count. Again, the Jeep had no problem at all. Even when I asked dad to slow down or even stop right on the steepest part of the dune, he was able to resume moving forward without even any wheel spin. 20 PSI is a wonderful thing and provides a huge contact patch in this soft sand. Temperatures are still scorching over 40 degrees Celsius and the humidity climbs throughout the day. While it might look like we're driving in circles, crossing the same dune over and over, I assure you that's not the case. This is exactly what the track looked like and every dune was windblown, not a tire track in sight. Often when we crested the hill, we had to find our own path and make sure we could still find the track so that we could get down the far side. I'll leave you now to experience the dune climbing just as we did. Storm clouds have been slowly gathering on the horizon all afternoon. I keep a close eye on them and a few times when I jump out to take photos, I'm staggered by how angry they look. There's plenty of thunder and lightning and we eagerly count the distance between the two, trying to gauge how far away we are from the centre of the storm. For the longest time we see rain in the distance and we think we're going to be able to skirt around the edge of it. We do that until we don't. Stop 
down in here we can just wait till it passes. As long as that takes. Might be able to winch off these trees. There's a lot of wood on the side. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to drive in when it's deep. It's very soft. There's a shallow spot. Wow. It's going to keep moving along slow and steady. Good plan. Wow, look at this. It's beautiful. The light is mind blowing. Lower, so we kick up less of it. Here we are after the rain and the hail. The mighty Canning Stock Route I never imagined. Look at this massive rainbow. <laughs> oh my god. Of all the things you would have told me to expect on the Canning, not this. Unbelievable. The storm passes just as quickly as it came, and soon we're all alone again, out in the middle of the desert. The only difference? Now there's quite a bit of standing water in the tyre tracks, but the temperature quickly skyrockets again, and it's obvious it all evaporates away pretty quickly. Of course, as luck would have it, we come across a couple of dry lake beds. Well lake beds that are normally dry. These things are a bit famous for people getting stuck and of course when you get stuck in the middle there's absolutely nothing to winch off and your only option is recovery boards and the shovel. I don't love that idea and so we play it pretty cautiously and hug the edge. There's tyre tracks out here so it's obvious that other people have done the same thing over the years. Maybe they encountered similar rain to us or maybe they were just being careful. I'm in four wheel drive and I try hard to keep a bit of momentum just to make sure that if things get squishy, we can use a bit of right foot and hopefully keep moving. It turns out it never does get squishy and we never even have a moment of hesitation. This lake bed is a lot firmer than it looks. When it comes to rainfall, I find the desert a strange place. Early in the season, the rain seems to soak into the ground and within a couple of hours, it's basically gone. To that end, this puddle we're driving through is about the biggest one we had to. It all just evaporated away. I think that's only true though at the beginning of the rainy season. At some point, the ground gets super saturated and suddenly the entire thing is a puddle. The water just never goes away. So again, I'm hoping there hasn't been much more rain to the north and that we can keep going. We've only got one day to go. We're getting close to the end now. There's more vegetation here at the northern end, probably because of the higher rainfall. And for hundreds and hundreds of meters, trees scrape down both sides of the Jeep. Something I've been doing regularly here is clearing grass out from under the Jeep. It's kind of collecting on one of the skid plates. I don't want it to get near the exhaust. And the reason is you get an underbelly grass fire. It's really common here on the canning. And this is the result of what happens when that happens. And interestingly enough, this is a Jeep Wrangler. This is a two-door JK, the same model that I drove around Africa. And uh, it's really crazy to see this was obviously on fire. It's crazy to see what the heat has done to it. Like you can see, this is what's left of the tires, just the steel belted radials. And look what it did to the rim, the aluminium rim. It's all melted, the aluminium's gone. That's such a classic Jeep rim, kind of every early Wrangler had that rim. And then coming around the back, well, it even says <laughs> Mopar on the original exhaust. Gonna have to get a photo of that. But then as we come around the other side, this is fascinating to me. I've never actually seen this before. This is incidentally the same model that I drove around Africa, has exactly the same engine, same gearbox, same transfer case. And as we come around, have a look, the gearbox has melted open. So this is the gearbox case 
have a look, we can just see straight into the gearbox because all of what I assume is aluminium has just melted away. And then as we move further back, the transfer case doesn't even have a case on it at all. We can just see the chain drive of the transfer case directly. It's just wide open. So <laughs> unbelievable what the heat has done under here. I just can't believe it. And, and looking at it all from upside down, you know, this is the 3.8 litre engine. It's the same engine that's in my Jeep sitting back in Canada. So crazy to see the fuel tank is gone because it was plastic, so it's melted away. And then the remnants of like, this is a rim, this is a wheel, it's just gone. The fire, the heat, absolutely insane. Good lesson to learn, always be checking for grass accumulating under your vehicle. Underbelly fires, they're a real thing. Overnight, the wind dies down and we only have the occasional shower come through. With the awning and walls deployed, it's no problem keeping the swag dry and having plenty of hangout space to cook dinner and stay dry. In the morning, we're greeted to a beautiful, bright, sunny day and it's already 34 degrees at six o'clock in the morning. It's going to be scorching hot and the humidity is through the roof. I keep my eyes on the clouds all day, expecting them to eventually group up and turn into another thunderstorm, although they never actually do. It kind of has that vibe, the same rainy season West Africa, where the thunderstorms build and build all afternoon and maybe let loose or maybe they don't. And today, they don't. We see plenty of camels on and near the trail and you'll also see we've driven back into termite mound territory, a sure sign that when it rains here, it seriously rains. As usual on the canning, just when we get used to one surface and scenery, everything changes from underneath us. We come across these enormous mountains that are absolutely spectacular. And after reading our little guidebook, we take a detour down into the valley attempting to find Brendan's Well, a kind of natural waterfall slash rock pool water pool that's back here in these mountains. The trail is seriously overgrown. We actually drive around in circles for a couple of hours and I even set out on foot for an hour in the scorching midday sun. I actually do get it in sight, but it's still probably a kilometer away and I've already gone up and over one mountain. I'm not too excited about going up and over another. So in the end, we just have lunch in the middle of these enormous mountains before we decide to continue on, unfortunately, without visiting these spectacular sites. Good morning, everyone. It is the morning of day 10 here on the Canning Stock Route. Wow, what an adventure, it just goes on and on. This is our campsite from last night. You can see we're kind of on this like dry lake bed. The texture is so incredible on the ground. You can probably hear it crunching under my feet. And a really beautiful place to camp. It's been quite windy, which is nice, but the flies are definitely out again. They've been a bit of a constant and it is hot already. It's uh, six o'clock in the morning right now. The sun's coming up at about 4.30 in the morning. So we get some early starts, we get on the road and we are getting mighty close to the end. So we think today we're going to get to the end of the trail. We're not actually sure. We'll just see how the road goes. This has been utterly incredible. Tons of heat lightning last night around camp, sat out, got some star photos, try to enjoy it, try to soak it all in as much as I possibly can. I don't even know what to say. I'm exhausted. I'm ecstatic. This has been a hell of an adventure. We hit the trail, feeling proud of ourselves, knowing that we're so close to the end. We cross a couple of small sand dunes, we move a few fallen branches out of the way and deal with even more pinstriping on the Jeep, but deep down, we know we're gonna make it to the end. As we get closer to civilization, we start seeing cattle stations, passing through gates, and actually, we get a bit turned around trying to find well 51. Because it's the last one, we figure we better find it. And eventually, when we do, 
we can't help smiling from ear to ear. From there, we're on pretty good cattle station roads all the way into town. But of course, the track throws one last challenge at us. Lots of standing water on the road. This is exactly the kind of thing that I was worried about. Had we been encountering this for the last 1,700 kilometers, I honestly don't know if we would have made it through. And as we roll the final couple of kilometers into town, we can't help smiling, high-fiving and celebrating. The Canning Stock Route has been everything I ever dreamed it would be. So here we are everyone, we are just about to finish the Canning Stock Route after 10 days, 1,700 kilometres. That's just over a thousand miles down at low tyre pressures, bumping along all that time out of the wilderness. We did not see a single vehicle. The only person we saw was at the halfway point when we fueled up. Other than that, no vehicles, no people, nobody ever replied to our radio call outs. If you can tell from the grin on my face, that is the most epic 10 day overland adventure of my life, I think on the planet. If you have ever thought about doing the canning, I cannot recommend it more highly. So many, so many thoughts and feelings and emotions right now, I need some time to digest. Dad and I, we're just about to head in Bilai Luna, which is a little Aboriginal community. We can get fuel there. We think the store might be open. Maybe we'll buy an ice cream to celebrate. Now we have another 900 kilometers to go, still on gravel, still aired down. So we're gonna do well over two and a half thousand kilometers aired down on rough gravel, bumpy roads. That just gets us to Alice Springs. Then it's another two and a half thousand kilometers to drive back to dad's place and wrap up this whole Australian adventure. This has been the final, the ultimate adventure. And I'm so glad that I squeezed it in. I'm so glad that we got out here. I'm so glad dad came with me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all the support on the Australia trip, especially the supporters on Patreon. These people make it happen. They've helped me be on the road. Without them, I wouldn't be able to bring you all of this content and show you what an incredible country and the incredible places you can get to here in Australia. So thank you to all you guys on Patreon and all you out there on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Unbelievable, what, what an experience, the Canning Stock Route. I am never going to forget this as long as I live.